Okay, perfect. So we'll just start right now. Um, yeah, so today we're going to talk about there's a ton of changes coming to the forms. And um, and I'm not sure how much time we're going to have because it, it actually might take a while because this is so important. I really don't want to breeze through this because um, a lot of these changes, um, your clients probably won't notice the changes, right? But if you want to, you, we really want to know what we're having people sign. So I um, please interrupt me if you have questions. Um, I did, I met with an MLS attorney um, on last Friday, I want to say, and um, and he explained some things in, in a bit more detail. So anyways, um, I'm going to try and go into enough detail, but not too much detail, but please, this should be open source. If you have any questions or anything to add, please speak up. And then as Robin alluded to, if we um, have time, I'd love to um, it kind of like tails off of the off of the forms because a lot of the form changes are were made specifically due to the fact that we're in such a crazy hot market. So if we have time today, I would love to um, talk about um, some quick tips to get your offer um, accepted in a really hot market. Um, if we don't have time today, then I might just do a twenty minute meeting tomorrow or thirty minute meeting tomorrow to uh, to cover that. So um, my notes. Okay. So there are one. Hey, one second. Chase just walked in. You gonna Chase gonna be here with me at my desk? That's perfect. Okay. <laughs> no, you're good. Yeah, you know you're all good. I was just making sure you didn't need me. So. Hey, Wilson. Anyway. Hi. Okay. So they made a ton of changes. So um, changes to almost every form. Um, and a lot of them are really minor changes. Um, one of the biggest changes they made, and this is such great news. They changed um, selling agent. Now the agent represent the buyer. We've always been called the selling agent. We're now called the buyer's agent. And so all the forms have been changed to say that, which is so awesome because I would love to never have to explain to a buyer again that selling agent really means buyer's agent and listing agent means seller's agent. And it's all very confusing. So anyways, if you look at the, at the legal bulletin that came out talking about the changes, it says we changed all these forms. That's overwhelming. In reality, we're going to go through the, mate, the, mate, the changes that were like the big changes in, in the forms, but technically almost every form was changed because we're now buyer's agents, not selling agent. Um, so yeah, we're going to jump right in. And then, and then my wife just came in. Kenzie, you want to say hi to everybody? Hello. Hi, Mackenzie. Hi. Station here. Hi. This is Mackenzie, for anyone who doesn't know. Hello. I'm waving, but you can't see me. <laughs> hi, everyone. Ooh. Okay. <clears throat> so, yeah, buyer broker and buyer brokerage firm. So all in Northwest MLS forms will be revised to replace the term selling broker and selling firm with buyer broker and buyer brokerage firm. For consistency, listing firm will be changed to listing brokerage firm. That's really the only, we don't really need to belabor that, but that's very, very exciting news. Um, okay, listing agreements, form 1A and 1B, the listing agreements have been updated to include a new, new paragraph regarding fair housing to ensure that the seller is aware of the apl applicable fair housing laws. There's a lot more legal jargon here explaining this, but I'm gonna explain it in normal human talk. Um, what that means is, we've talked about this in previous meetings before, this is really important. Um, the seller can pick any offer they want, right? Um, that's technically true, but we need to be advising our client and the 1A, the 1A now does advise, does say this, but now we need to, if it's me, I'm going to highlight this. I'm going to draw attention when they sign the 1A to the fair housing paragraph. And the fair housing paragraph is saying you, again, I'm paraphrasing, you should read it yourself and, and, and understand it yourself. But what it's essentially saying is you should be picking an offer solely based off of the the tangible aspects of the offer, i.e. waived inspections, higher above appraised value on the 22 AD, cash versus finance, higher purchase price, you should not at all be considering the name of the buyer. You should not be considering the picture the buyer included with the offer of their whole family smiling with their kid. You should not be looking at reading a letter by them. Um, I encourage my sellers when I before before we list their home, I say, hey, a lot of buyers are going to have letters with their um, with their offers. If you give me permission, I need your permission to not share it with you because if you don't give me permission, I have to send you everything they send. But if you tell me to exclude those, I will. And that's why I encourage you to do because 
it should be a blind test, right? It should, it should be, what is the best offer based off of terms and price? And um, that's, and so I'm really glad they added this to the 1A because now this is a talking point. When they're signing the 1A, you're talking about commission and everything. You should really talk about fair housing. And um, if they say they still want to see the letters, that's fine. Um, but if they are, um, you just just make sure you're you're explaining this to them and saying you like you are at risk of being sued um, if you are accepting an offer off of anything other than terms. Um, and and I'm going to use a real story um, case law in in California. This happened in 2019. I want to say. Um, a, um, th there were multiple offers and, um, and they accepted an offer that was less than another offer um, um, because they loved the, the letter from this family and they were saying how they're so excited to raise their kids in this home. This is going to be their perfect family home. And um, I'm trying to be really careful because I don't, I, I, it's all speculative. I don't, I don't know what the seller's was intention, but let's assume the seller, let's assume the best of the seller. They really, they were okay taking an offer 10,000 less because they love the idea of this family enjoying their home. So they were sued by um, a, a same sex couple um, because the same sex couple said they picked this traditional family over us because of our sexual orientation. Um, uh -huh. And they won. The, um, the, the same sex couple, they won um, because the seller could not prove um, that the, because the terms were not better on the one that they accepted. And even though the seller, I'm, I'm going to defend the seller, even though I have no idea if the seller was being um, inappropriate or not. Let's say the seller had the best intentions and they really just, they're like, oh, we're fine taking 10,000 less. We just want to bless this family and let them have our home. And that makes us so happy to have it. Not good enough. It just doesn't work. Um, That's concerning discriminatory of familial status. Exactly. And even though, even uh, if they don't mean for it to be, and that's the important part that you want to explain to your seller is right. you can discriminate on accident and not even know you're doing it. And that's, and that's the important part there. What could they have done to CYA and still accept that offer? No, as far as I know, this, Wilson just asked, what could they have done to accept that offer? Um, and, and CYA cover your ass, right? <laughs> Excuse my language, but, um, I, I don't think there is anything, honestly. My 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 interpretation of fair housing, you can't um, you can't. Right. Do um, I don't. I, I so would just yeah, take I the best offer. Put an attorney on that, um, but I don't think I don't think there's a way to do that. I think the safest answer, if you want to not get sued, is accept the best offer. Period. Um, and the best offer, again, is not price. I'm not talking about, about the highest offer. You can accept another offer because it's cash and it has a weight inspection that's 50,000 less than the next highest offer. I'm not talking about that. I'm just saying you better have a darn good reason why you're accepting this offer over this offer. And it should have nothing to do with anything about the buyer unless it's their financing or something to that effect. Does I that think yes. So what I was thinking was you know, maybe in the agent remarks disclose, like, please do not submit your seller letters. We're not considering them you or like totally do have it. that in additional broker remarks. And then before you even put the house on the market, have a disclosure. If you think your clients potentially could be sentimental, let's say, maybe not. I know you're playing devil's advocate, but maybe they're not trying to be discriminatory. Maybe they're just sentimental. You know, they want someone that grew up like they grew up taking that home or something. Um, you could have them sign a disclosure that says like, we will not be considering dear seller letters. And if so, like I will be encouraging my client to pick the highest and best offer. Yeah, you're, I, I would, I totally agree. But the signing, you don't need them signing thing. It's in the 1A and you just, and I agree with you. I would say, um, you, get their permission. If they give you permission to say that in the broker remarks, they do please don't include sell, buyer letters um, and then get their permission to exclude those. Like um, when you send them to the seller, um, you don't even sign anything. They just say, don't send it or do send it. Um, and then again, if they say, no, I want to see the letters. That's fine. If they say, I want to accept this offer. That's fine. Um, it's just make sure you're properly disclosing, which we are now in the 1A and Wilson had something else to say. So as a broker, how do you uh, aside from pointing out the fair housing paragraph, how do we avoid any potential risk to the broker? Anything more we can do or say? It's a really good question. Craig and I were just talking about this. Craig and Andrew and I were just talking about this the other day. Um, um, so the, there are um, examples that I've read where if you if you are become aware of a material defect, you have to disclose that, right? If you become aware 
i.e. they say, I do not want to accept that offer because of something about that buyer, then yes, we are responsible at that point for saying, um, I can, I cannot, I am bound by fair housing laws and I cannot, um, work with you. Then I have to, I, 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 um, I cannot proceed with this transaction. Um, Devin and I had to do that. We had a potential seller and we were talking about listing their home and she told us the kind of buyer she wanted to put in the home. And we explained that that was discriminatory and we couldn't do that and she said that it mattered to her anyway and that was part of the reason that we ended up firing her as an, a client for us right or just not taking the job yeah exactly I, I don't know craig do you want to speak up what would you do if um let me paint a, an example here and then have you answer um i'm selling wilson's home in wilson um and we get 10 offers and wilson wants to accept an offer that is clearly not as good as another offer but Wilson doesn't say anything about the other offer being, you know, about why he's doing it. But I say, well, Wilson, why do you want to accept this offer? He says, I just want to accept that offer. I just get a better feeling about it. This is exactly why Craig and I were talking about this the other day. The person I'm referring to said, I just have a better feeling about that buyer. I have no idea if it was racially motivated, none at all. But the offer that he wanted to accept was clearly not as good as the offer he did not want to accept. So Craig, how would you go about that? Deliver the offer as you're supposed to. You delivered it though. And now they, and they said, I want to accept this clearly lesser offer. Um, as right. opposed to this what are you, so, so they're going to do that because they have the right to do that. And they didn't give you any indication that they were being discriminatory factually that you know of. So then you're going to get it accepted. And you know, unfortunately you're going to have a very upset party once it closes that, wonders why their offer wasn't accepted when it was clearly higher than what was recorded at. And then you just, you know, loose lips sink ships. So you just will explain to that person, I'm sorry, it's a very unfortunate situation. And I followed the laws of agency. I presented both offers and all they could tell me is that they had a fit, better feeling about the closing Meaning ter terms of this offer and leave it at that. I agree with you. Less leave it to price and leave it to terms. Yep, and absolutely. So in a more, situation but... like what Robin and Devin experienced, then you go, sorry, I just got to walk away according to the law of agency. Yep, absolutely. So I completely agree on that. It, it, less is more. Don't don't say more than you have to to the to the person who lost. Um, but yes, if if you do not have any, if you did not hear anything. Um, regarding fair housing violations from your seller and they still want to go with another offer, it's not our job to presume what their intentions are. They still have the right to do that. And they signed the 1A, now the new updated 1A that specifically talks about fair housing. We pointed it out to them. They're good with it. And that's their risk at that point and their choice. Um, if you're and feeling- also, excuse me, it, it's the same thing as I always facetiously tell somebody, you're signing a marketing agreement with me when you're signing a listing agreement. And if Someone chooses to offer you $1 million for your $500,000 asking, you don't have to take it. Well, conversely, you can take one that's lower, right? The seller can do whatever they want to do. They've signed a marketing agreement. And then on the purchase and sale agreement, they can do what they want to do as well. Absolutely. And you just give them the best advice you can. But yeah, I guess very rare we're going to have these situations and people are going to do things that surprise you yeah. as a seller. But isn't it funny that we're saying this and we're going, well, that's just shocking. Why would they do that? Well, can I ask you all then, why would people pay $100,000 over asking price and $100,000 over low appraisal? Why isn't that as shocking? So yeah. just don't read into it. Just do your job. Yeah, absolutely. And then if somebody, if somebody, yeah, all we're supposed to do is if somebody is specifically saying they're accepting an offer over another offer for a reason that is protected by fair housing, that is when you cannot proceed. But it's not our job to interpret why they are doing that. It's our job to disclose that they are at risk of getting sued if they do that. And then if they decide to go forward, that's that. Okay. <clears throat> For anyone who just joined, we were just talking about the change on the 1A and the 1B that talks about that added fair housing, um, an explanation for fair, fair housing. Um, 
Okay, so there are changes to all the purchase and sale forms. So I'm just gonna talk about the form 21, but all of them, the form 20, 23, 25, and 28 are all have all have these same changes, but let's just talk about the form 17 in particular. This one's super cool. So um, uh, line seven, earnest money, now allows the parties to negotiate when the earnest money is deposited. If left blank, it's going to be two days. Um, a lot of people think three, by the way, um, if you read down on page one or two, I mean, two or three of the form of the forms, it taught, it explains the computation and time for earnest money. It's three days. If the buy, if the buyer's agent, oh, I almost said selling agent. If the buyer's agent delivers it, but if the buyer is going to deliver it, it is two days if left blank, but now on the front page, it's going to be negotiable. So you can say three days, four days, et cetera. Um, I'm going to be going through notes, so I apologize. I'm going to have these awkward pauses as I catch myself up on where I'm at. So bear with me here. Um, okay, this is important. Um, I get this question a lot. If earnest money is mailed, it is not the mail date anymore. Um, and, and I didn't have time to research this. I thought that was the opposite. Um, now it is when the earnest money is going to be delivered, um, is going to arrive at the escrow office or, or the closing agent. Um, that's really important, right? So if you have a, a client who's out of town, I've got two right now I'm pending on. And, um, and I'm now questioning myself because I, I would have sworn it was uh, the mail date, but um, this is saying, um, the, it, it defines that um, it's the date the earnest money is received. So again, if you have clients who are out of town and they're going to be mailing a check um, as opposed to wiring because they don't want to spend 30 bucks on a wire, make sure you do renegotiate the earnest money delivery to four or five or six days, right? In short- Not no crazy. What? That's the thing that people always went by before. Yeah. The mail date. Are you confirming what I'm saying? That, that it used yes, to be yeah. when it was in the mail? The post date. Yeah, that's what I thought. So they changed. So that that is a change then. That's cool. a change. Hey, thank you for confirming that. Um, good. So I'm protected on the ones I'm pending on because I know they didn't they didn't arrive within two days. Um, okay. So in short, no matter how the earnest money is delivered, it must be delivered to the party holding the earnest money by the delivery date. Um, okay. Agency disclosure uh, specific term. This is on uh, line 15 of uh, form 21 might be different on the other forms. Um, so now it says buyer represented by buyer broker, buyer slash listing broker, um, in parentheses, dual agent or unrepresented. And then seller represented by listing broker, listing slash buyer broker slash dual agent or unrepresented. Just a reminder, I've seen um, a few lists, a few in the in this past year, we're, we're growing brokers, right? We have 52 agents now, regardless of with if you're with, um, Actually, this is important. I haven't said this before. If you're with the Gig Harbor office or the Tacoma office, the Gig Harbor office is a um, satellite office. It's still part of Realty One Group Turnkey. Um, so that is a dual agency, whether or not you're representing the buyer and seller on both sides or Craig's representing the buyer and Rhonda's representing the seller. Okay, it's still a dual agency. And this is really important on the, section 15 of the form 21. You have to check the boxes buyer slash listing broker, dual agent, and listing slash buyer broker, dual agent. Really, really important. I've corrected a few um, agents on that this year. So just make sure you're doing that. And as always, if you have a dual agency, we are totally fine with you doing dual agency. You're just required to let me know so I can kind of oversee it a little more than I do on most transactions. I'm not going to micromanage. I just want to keep an eye on it. I always try and quote this and I'm, I'm always wrong. It's something like 60% of lawsuits against real estate brokerages um, are on dual agent transactions. So please let me know when you have a dual agency um, so I can just be aware of it and, and kind of follow along, make sure everything's um, going as planned. Yeah, as I say, note that the listing broker procures the buyer but does not represent the buyer as a dual agent. The buyer would be unrepresented. Um, that, that happens um, often on for sale by owners, right? So you'd write an offer for a for sale by owner. You would check buyer broker represents the buyer, right? But then on the seller represented by, it would be unrepresented. So that's pretty obvious. But as always, don't hesitate to ask if you have questions. This is awesome. Um, there's always been back and forth and you ask 10 different agents and you get five answers on each side. FERPTA is now um, required. Um, so I'm going to do a little reading here as opposed to interpreting it myself. Um, so the line, um, the FERPTA line on the, um, on the Form 21 and all the purchase sales have been revised to require the seller to deliver the 22E um, to the closing agent within 10 days of mutual acceptance. Okay, didn't notice that the first time I read it. Actually, it has to be delivered to the closing agent. 
that's odd. It doesn't say to the buyer um, or buyer's agent. Well, okay. So um, it has to be delivered within 10 days of mutual acceptance. The seller can fill out and provide the form to the closing agent directly in the listing firm and buyer brokerage firm can confirm with the closing agent that the seller has done so. That's kind of annoying that they wouldn't just send to the buyer. They're not required to just send to the buyer's agent, but apparently they're not required to send to the buyer's agent. But here's the important part. If the seller fail, fails to timely provide the FERPA certification to the closing agent, the buyer may give notice that if the seller does not provide the certification to the closing agent within three days, the buyer may terminate the agreement. If three days passes and the seller has not still not provided the FERPA, the buyer may terminate and their earnest money is refunded to the buyer. Um, a lot of what the, a lot of these changes in the forms, I like um, they it's not really a change. It's more a, um, they added teeth to if this doesn't happen. So you'll see as we go on. Um, so like we've always, you know, we've asked for the 22E, but there hasn't been like, well, what happens if a seller refuses to give us a 22E? Well, now there's some teeth to it. Now it's saying if they don't, you can back out. So that's kind of cool. And then there's um, notice forms, a 90 FERPTA. And we're going to, there's, this is throughout, um, throughout all these changes, they've added form 90s, which are notices that you use in these circumstances. So you don't, um, the, almost never guys, if you're going to back out because of a failure for a seller or buyer to do something, there's almost always a form 90 to do so. So you, it's not like, hey, we're backing out because you never did the FERP die. Here's my email saying we're backing out. There's a form 90 for it. Okay, computation of time. There are several forms that require action a certain amount of time before closing, right? So the example they use is um, three days before closing, repairs must be done, or uh, RSS must be filed X 10 days before closing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they specified now on comp, they added to the computation of time that um, if three days before closing was a Sunday or a Saturday or a holiday, it would then uh, go to the next, not the previous, the next weekday. So that, should make sense, but that was never specified on the computation of time. Now it is. On a vacant land purchase and sale agreement, we were, uh, they revised to clarify that if feasibility contingency addendum 35F is included in the agreement, then that portion of the um, of the form 25 is, is trumped by the 35F. So if they're conflicting, um, which I can't imagine why that would happen. If you put 10 days on the form 25, but then you put 30 days on the 35F, 35F supersedes. Financing addendum form 22A has been significantly revised. Okay. To simplify the form, the paragraph regarding loan information has been removed. So this is, I'm going to share my screen. This is something that I was going to <laughs> I was going to talk today about at the end of this meeting, I was going to talk about um how to get your ways that you can make your offer more attractive. And I was going to talk about using this portion. Well, I'm not going to talk about it anymore because it's being removed from the form uh, 22A. So I'm pulling it up right now. Um, so on the 22A, there is, can everyone see my screen? I'm going to assume yes. Yes, we can. Fantastic. Okay, so on the 22A, you have halfway down on the first page, loan information. This whole part is being removed, um, which, which is actually whatever. I'm not going to interpret why it was removed. Um, they were just saying to simplify things. And what they said is the buyer authorizes the seller and the listing broker to inquire about the status of a buyer's loan with the lender from time to time, classic legal jargon. So that, I mean, all that, we don't need to belabor this. Section two is being removed. Section three, um, the waiver, the 22 AR portion, I'm just gonna read this part. The revised, the revised form provides two options for the financing contingency in the paragraph three. So now they're changing it to seller's notice to perform. Seller may give notice to perform to the buyer requesting that the buyer waives their financing contingency. If the buyer does not waive the financing contingency, then after three days, the seller may terminate the agreement and the earnest money will be refunded to the buyer. Really, that's all the same as the 22AR used to be. They just changed the name to notice, what did I say? Uh, 
seller's notice to perform. So it's no longer called the right to terminate notice, it's called seller's notice to perform, which I actually really like because I always have to explain when I send a 22 AR and I'm re representing the seller, we're not trying to back out, we're just like trying to get you to waive your financing. <laughs> okay. Um, so here, here's the big changes here. Yeah, it says this is the same process with slightly different terminology and the default timeline has been used in the form as, as what the default timeline used to be. Um, so the new second option, there's now a second option that says automatic waiver of financing. So we're skipping ahead to the end of this meeting when we're gonna talk about writing really competitive offers. So now you can, you can um, so we're still seeing my screen. So now there's going to be a second option where you can say after 20 days or 30 days or 25 days, the buyer's financing contingency will automatically be waived. That would be an awesome way to make a really attractive offer. Of course, there's all kinds of disclosure here, disclosures here that says, make sure you're explaining this to your buyer because that's a huge risk. Um, but just like we have here, section 3C, where it says buyer's waiver of the financing contingency will or will not waive the appraisal, you can still select that. So I'm sorry, I'm talking in circles. Let me put down my notes and just explain what this means. So section three, you have um, the seller's right to terminate notice, which they changed the name on. Anyways, um, you can check one that box that says the seller can send this at 20 days or 30 days or whatever, um, to which the buyer has three days to respond. Yes, we're waiving our financing contingency or no, we're not waiving our financing contingency. <clears throat> You can now and you can do that, or you can say after 20 days, 30 days, 10 days, whatever, our um, financing contingency is waived. You're still getting financing, but we're not contingent on it. Ergo, if our financing falls through, um, then the um, and we can't get a loan, um, we don't have to close, but we lose our earnest money. Does that make sense? Um, so that's a really, really attractive thing that you can do. Be really careful when you're explaining it to buyers that this is not something you should do lightly. But if you're, if you have a buyer who um, is really confident in their financing, right, they've been in a, um, they've, uh, they have a really solid job and they're well qualified. It's something that you should really consider. Cause if I'm, if I'm representing a seller, I think that's, that's incredibly attractive. Um, and then again, if you want to be safe and you want to waive your financing minus the, uh, the appraisal, you can still check will or will not waive my appraisal if I waive my financing. Sorry, that's complicated. If that, some of that went over your head, feel free to call me and we can ex I can explain it in a little more detail. Um, but yeah, do call me because it's it's really important, especially whether you're representing a buyer or a seller, this can be the difference to get an offer accepted. And this can also, if you're representing a seller, be a huge, huge factor when, it, um, when considering to accept an offer. Um, one last thing on that. Um, People, when they want to write an offer with financing, but say we're waiving our financing from day one, there's 57,000 different ways I've seen people do that. Now, if you ever want to do that, you'll just use this and you'll just say zero days on buyer automatic. So buyers automatically waiving their financing contingency, but you're still using the 22A to say we're getting financing and it's conventional and it's 20% down. However, it's waived immediately. So I'm disclosing that we're getting financing, but it's not contingent on it. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, um, I love this. They finally added the um, every the the exact terminology from the VA escape clause addendum, the 22 VA, into the 22 A. So we no longer need um, a 22 VA when you're representing a um, a uh, VA buyer, um, which is awesome because we can just avoid that that form. Um, obviously, there may be some lenders who don't understand that. And they may say, well, we still need it, whatever, but technically you don't need it because they're putting the exact terminology um, into the 22A. So that's exciting. Please note that the current version of the financing and just blah, 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 blah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So they're changing the 22AR and the 22AL. They're changing, they're changing all those forms because now they're no longer needed. Any questions so far about any of that? Okay. Um, okay. So now we're going to talk about the form, the 22AD, the very popular form in this ridiculously hot market. So the increased down payment for low appraisal, the 22AD, has been modified to include an option for transactions where the buyer is obtaining a loan, B, the agreement is not contingent on the buyer obtaining a loan, or C, the agreement includes an appraisal addendum. They're including that all in the 22AD. 
So you can, it, they'll have more options. 2280 is a really simple form and now that it's going to have more options, um, removing the need for uh, the form 22AA, the appraisal of them. The new provision requires buyers to disclose that the buyer is obtaining a loan to purchase a property, including the amount of the down payment, similar to the current form. The form states that if the appraisal value is less than the purchase price, the buyer shall pay additional funds towards their down payment. If the buyer's appraised value plus the additional funds are equal or greater than the purchase price, the buyer may not terminate the agreement under Form 22AA. Okay, that's about it on that one. Uh, buyer's sale of property contingency, that's the Form 22B, has been updated to clarify issues related to the buyer's waiver of contingency. This is really interesting. I don't know why they did this, but really important to know. If you have a buyer who is writing an offer that is contingent on um, selling the home, so there's a revision to paragraph four provides if in response to the seller's bump notice, buyer decides to waive the contingency, the waiver of the contingency sell also waive contingencies, all other contingencies in this agreement. Okay, really important. So what this is saying is if, so when you get, when you use a 22B, there's normally a five day bump period. Uh, you, it can be negotiated high, more or less, um, which means um, we're pending on uh, the seller's home and then the seller gets another offer to which they say, hey, we received another offer and we accepted it. And now you have five days to waive your contingency um, or else this new offer will, will, take, will go ahead of yours. Um, now, if you, waive, um, if you waive your contingency as a contingent buyer, you're also waiving all other contingencies, financing, title, et cetera. Again, I don't actually know why they did it. They didn't really explain it, but that's, that's huge. That's really, really important to know. Um, yeah, that's about it on that one. So helps the helps the seller. it does help. Yeah, helps Wilson seller. just said it helps the seller. It absolutely helps the seller. And it really puts pressure on the buyer um, to, um, I mean, that's it's a lot of pressure. Paragraph five on the um, on the 22D, that's utilities. Uh, uh, I think we can partially thank Rhonda for this one because she brought this up to me like six months ago. And I um, and I was like, oh my gosh, that's such a great point. And I, and I put in feedback to the MLS and they finally added this. So Rhonda was, um, I, I want to say, rep representing a buyer on a home um, on the Key Peninsula. And um, after they had gotten through most of their contingencies, I want to say, I may be telling the story a little wrong. Um, they found out, that um, there was no internet provider out there, literally none. Like the only option he had was to get like one of those Verizon like cell phone internet provider things, um, which wasn't good enough for him because he was uh, he worked from home. Um, and anyways, so they added cable and internet um, on the form 22D, which is super cool because now if you, especially people working remotely, um, that's an important thing to know that they can get cable and internet um, at the property. Um, the lead-based paint disclosure was previous, which previously was combined form for both purchase and sale. Uh, now they made a new one for leases and purchases. We don't do property management, so nothing really there. Um, septic form, the septic addendum has been clarified to provide that similar to the inspection addendum, the agreement is conditioned on the buyer's subjective satisfaction of the inspection report. That's super cool. Um, so yeah, it's just saying that if the, um, that not only does the seller need to have the septic system pumped and RSS filed, they need to provide said reports to the buyer and the buyer has X amount of days to review said reports and make sure that they are satisfactory. And can I throw out there, this means now when you go to do a listing before your listing goes on the market, if you have a septic system or if your seller has a septic system, you want to get it pumped and get the RSS filed so that you have that available to provide, right? Great. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. That's a really great point because um, yeah, when you're representing the seller, um, as, as we all know, we're trying to give as few outs as possible for the buyer who already has a ton of outs. And so um, the longer it takes to get your septic pump, Mr. or Mrs. Seller, the longer the buyer has to back out um, on some technicality. So that's a really great point. Thank you for saying that. Um, the title contingency addendum, it's always been confusing where it says you have X amount of days from mutual acceptance or X amount of days from getting the, uh, from receiving the title report. Really confusing because it's like, well, 
it was attached in the supplement. So you received it when you saw the home or it, anyways, they took that out from now on. If you included title contingency, the 22 T title contingency sup, supplement, it's only after mutual acceptance. So whatever your timeline is, it's just after mutual acceptance. That's another like major FAQ. I get that question all the time. And I'm always like, uh, you know, it's, that was a complicated one. No more. Um, okay, the inspection addendum has been significantly revised and reformatted, their words. Um, okay, paragraph one has been revised to clarify, in addition to the general home inspection conducted by the buyer or a licensed inspector, by the buyer or a licensed inspector, the buyer may engage specialists, i.e. plumbers, electricians, roofs, to inspect the property during the initial inspection period. Um, I, I asked this one uh, to the attorney who I spoke with. And he was like, um, and he, he told me, yeah, technically you need to permit, you need permission to have like a contractor or an electrician to go. And I was like, oh, I bet 95% of real estate agents, including me, didn't actually know that. And we have had electricians and plumbers and roofers go out without permission. Anyway, so they just added to the, uh, to the wording that it can be, that you can, during your inspection timeline, have anybody else go there. So anyways, that's one that we probably didn't even know that we couldn't do, but now it doesn't matter. So, <laughs> um, Okay, this is awesome. So we all know a year ago or so um, they changed um, they changed the um, in the thirty five to say that you cannot share the inspection report or any portion of the inspection report without the seller's written consent. So they added forms for um, getting consent now. So they you can't just call the agent and say. Uh, I'm sure this is what happened. I call the agent. I say, hey, do you want me to send a report? And the agent says, yeah, send it to me. I send it to them. And then the seller's like, I didn't want to see this. And now they say, well, now you violated the contract. Um, and I said, well, the agent gave me permission. The agent did it on the phone. So I don't have proof that they gave me permission. Anyways, they simplified that. If you send an inspection response and they say, we want to see the inspection report, they have to send you now a form 35C, which is the seller giving you permission to then send you the inspection report. I know this sounds like a lot of work for not a lot of good. It's really important because um, if you if you send an inspection report to a seller and they see that now they, they ha now have material um, information on potential material defects, right? And so it's really important to follow, um, to just follow the rules. This is really just kind of adding more, um, uh, more of a um, system for how to do the same thing. Nothing, the rule hasn't really changed. And they also now specify in the 35, if this is, this is a key, because they never specified this before. If the buyer's agent does send the seller listing broker, the, um, uh, inspection report or any portion of the inspection report without the seller's written consent, your inspection response, your inspection contingency is waived, which I love that they did that because now it like added teeth. It's like, okay, they just said it wasn't allowed and they didn't say what actually happens. And I had this happen last year twice. And I called the listing, bro the, um, the attorney at the MLS and he's like, yeah, well, I guess it's probably waived. And I was like, probably, what does that mean? And he's like, well, we didn't, it's not really specified. Well, now it's specified. So if you're a buyer's agent, do not send the inspection report without written consent on the 35C that you can send it. And if you're the seller's agent and the listing agent and the buyer does send the inspection report without written consent, guess what? You have a waived inspection. So that's pretty cool. Okay. Uh, the provision in form 35 regarding waiver of inspection and pre-inspection have been moved to a new form. So there is now an inspection waiver addendum. So instead of using a 35 when you're, oh, Aisha, it says you're raising your hand. I'm not sure if you're waving or raising your hand, but if you. I'm, I'm raising my hand. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, I can. Go ahead. Okay. So I just have a question because um, about the 35R and the inspection report. Um, so I'm still, you know, fairly new to all of this, right? But I have you know, done like a 35 R and all that stuff. And whenever I did, when I did the inspection and let's say there was one, I had one where the roof needed to be repaired, right. Mm -hmm. Or replaced. And I was told at that time that I don't send the entire report. Um, I only send the section of the inspection report that mentions the part about the roof. So, is so that still, I'm, nope. and I only did that when the listing agent asked me for it. Yeah. So, so, um, so I'm going to answer your question 
multiple different levels here. Um, okay. One, when you send your inspection report, I mean, your inspection response, your 35R, you do not yeah. send anything else with it. You can, I, I do this most of the time when I'm asking for a lot. I say in my email, I say, if you would like to see my, the inspection report or a portion of the inspection reports, let me know. And I will, and we will send it to you. Um, right. To which they now to the second part of your question, to which oftentimes the listing broker will say, I don't want to see a whole thing, but send me the part about the roof. Well, now that's right. not good enough. Now you have to say, please send me a 35C signed by your seller saying that you want me to send that to you. Okay. So okay. That's okay. The change here. Um, okay. But, but yeah, really, really important. Do not send, do not text any portion of it. Don't send. Yeah, anything. I don't. Listing broker. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank Nothing you. Good, I was just saying. Um, yeah, so I really like this change. Um, if you now want to waive your inspection, um, you don't include a 35, you include a 35W. Um, so they just will now see a form 35W, which means the uh, inspection, um, you, you are waiving your right to an, to an inspection. And the cool part about that is it also says to the buyer, it also discloses to the buyer, we encourage you to get a home inspection and you are waiving your right to a home inspection, um, which I kind of like because... Um, there's very little, uh, there's really, there was very little underneath that portion on the uh, former th form 35 that, that explained like, hey, you have a right to a home inspection and you are saying you don't, you're not using that. So that's awesome because that's kind of a CYA for all of us. When we have a buyer doing that. Um, and they also have a paragraph two. Pre oh, no, no, no. Um, so then they also changed the pre-inspection um, portion to state that the buyer conducted an inspection of the property prior to mutual acceptance and the purchase and sale agreement is not conditioned on the results of such inspections, but they added somewhere on, um, they added right below that, um, the buyer can request, hey, we did a pre-inspection and our offer is as is without an inspection. However, we are requesting that you do X, Y, and Z, which is super cool because in the past, we just, I've done that a few times and we just had to use a form, form 34. Okay, escalation addendums have been significantly revised. They say that on everyone, that's so funny. Uh, please note that, that there continue to be many risks and challenges associated with using the Form 35E. There, they have a whole paragraph here about, um, we have a 35E that you can use, but you shouldn't use it, which is really funny to me. Um, I have no problem with the 35E. I know this is being recorded and it's gonna be posted on, on YouTube. So I'm, I'm being careful, but I, it's not that complicated, okay? Um, the 35E, a lot of people, including uh, the attorney who's the head of the Association of Realtors and MLS attorneys, they all say, here's the 35E, but you probably shouldn't use it. Not saying I disagree with attorneys, but if you read it carefully and you fill it out carefully, it's not that complicated. Um, just take your time. Don't fill it in fast, especially when you're the listing broker and you're filling in the 35B, do it slowly. And it all, and it's all very, very simple to use, but they're, um, they, they disclose in this huge long paragraph that like the reasons why a 35E can be, um, a scary form to use, you know, like you're saying as a buyer that, Hey, we'll go up to 450, but our offer is 400. You're showing them all your cards. I mean, we explain that all to our buyers. So as long as you're explaining the form properly and saying, Hey, we are showing them our cards ahead of time. And now they know that we'll go up to 450. I don't have a problem with that because Yes, they could cross out the 35E and just counter it at 450, but you, buyer, don't have to do it unless they fill out the Form 35E properly and show you the competing offer that escalated your offer. So take it or leave it, be very careful with it, but um, they just want to advise you to be very, very, very careful when you are using a Form 35E. Um, they did change... Um, they did change the definition of net price to seller to include um, to include if you as a, a buy, um, buyer's agent are crediting part of your commission in order to make the offer more attractive. So um, I've never even seen that, but they're saying um, if I am writing an offer on a four hundred thousand dollar home and I want to include two thousand dollars in my commission um, to the seller's closing costs that will also be factored into the 35E. I haven't seen that before, but now you can. Um, the form has been revised to clarify that if the seller fails to include, this is important. This is the teeth portion again. The form has been revised to clarify that if the seller fails to include a copy of the competing offer at the time of mutual acceptance, then the buyer is entitled to, the, to purchase a property at the non-escalated price. Really, really, really important there. 
Um, so it's not just like a verbal, oh yeah, we got another offer at 442. Your offer is now 442. No, you have to include it with the offer. Really, really important. And remember what constitutes delivery. It has to be sent to the listing broker. I mean, sorry, in this case, the buyer's broker, the buyer's brokerage firm, and your firm as well. So this is huge. This means if you didn't send it right when you send your um, the offer back, mutual acceptance or a counter, then it's not valid. So you could you could seriously screw your client out of thousands of dollars, thousands of dollars. So just really to simplify, make sure when you send the escalating offer, the 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 um, the accepted offer with using the escalation, you send the escalating offer. I think I said that right. <laughs> I think you guys get it though. Okay, to qualify as a competing offer, the offer must be a complete copy of a bona fide arm's length written offer on the Northwest MLS or similar forms containing all material terms necessary for an enforceable agreement. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, so what that means. I, yes. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, I spoke with the attorney about it. I'll, I'll call on you in just a second, Sarah. I spoke with the attorney about that. And um, I said, what, what does arm's length transaction mean in, in, in your opinion? And, um, and I said, does that mean not, not a dual agent? And he said, no, but it, do, it does mean it cannot be the listing broker's offer. Um, I wish they would have said that more clearly, but that was his interpretation of what that means. And that's my interpretation as well. That's what they mean by arm's length. What were you going to say, Sarah? I was going to ask, um, does that apply? So if you are the, and this is probably what you just said, if you are the listing broker, but you also have buyers that want to buy the house that you're listing, you can't use their offer to that's escalate exactly. someone else's price. That's exactly the okay. attorney that I spoke with in my interpretation. Um, unfortunately, okay. it doesn't say that exactly, but arm's length I would say if it's my buyers, that's not an arm's length. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. so that's how I interpret that. Um, but he did, he did say he does not think that applies for dual agency. So, you know, Devin's buyer can still write an offer and I can still use that to increase the other offer. So, um, um, the, and it cannot be a contingent sale. That was the other part I wanted to say. It cannot be a contingent buyer, which is a change. And that's awesome. Um, because that's so, um, that, that I, I've always thought that would be unfair. Um, okay, there have been instances with competing offers that the seller included with the seller's acceptance did not qualify as a competing offer because the closing date fell more than 60 days. Page outside of the time period in the offer. So that's, there, I mean, that's not a change. The, the 35E specifically says within, it has to be an offer that is also closing within the X amount of days. So I don't know why they said that because that was already in there. Does that make sense? Did I just breeze over that too fast? If, if my Isaac? Audience... Yes, sir. So prior, the 35E said that it cannot be a contingent on selling your home offer. That was in there. But it, I believe it allowed a pending. Can you clarify that? You're saying that there's something new here? No, I didn't think the prior one did say that. So you're correcting me. Um, well, it, so this says, I'm, not I'm going to read certain. exactly. It says, to qualify as a competing offer, the, the offer must be a complete copy of a bona fide arm's length written offer on Northwest MLS or similar forms containing all material terms necessary for an enforceable agreement with which A, requires a full purchase price to be paid in cash at closing. That doesn't mean a cash buyer. That means paid in cash at closing, which all of them do. Um, I guess that would, that would, um, prohibit somebody from doing like a uh, owner financing, very rare, but uh, provides for closing no later than blank 60 days, if not filled in from the date of the, of that offer and C is not contingent on the sale of the buyer's property. No Northwest form 22 B or equivalent. That's what it says. So I might, I might get back to you on that one, Craig, because it, that specifically references the 22 B, but then it says, or equivalent. I don't know how do you how do you interpret that, Craig? Craig might be gone. 
I'll get back to you guys on that. I don't know if they, uh, so Craig saying you use a different form if you're writing an offer on a, um, if you're writing an offer and your buyer is pending on their home that they're selling, it's you use a 22. Q. Q. Yeah. Thank you. A 22 Q. Q instead of a 22B. Um, and so I will get back to you guys on that. I don't, I don't know if that's a change. So thanks for bringing that up, Craig. Yeah, I'm not certain either. I'm pretty sure 22B wasn't allowed prior, 22Q was, and I'm wondering if they're saying that the new one, the 22Q is not. So we'll definitely need yeah. to re-circle yeah, back on that. They only reference 22B, so I, I'm, I'm guessing you're probably right. Hmm. Okay. It comes uh, down to whether 22Q and 22B are equivalent, right? That's what, yeah, that it's interesting that they use the word equivalent um, because they're not a, equivalent, equal, right? So I don't know. Um, so I'll get back to everyone on that. In the new paragraph B, the buyer has three days, if not filled in, from mutual acceptance to provide notice to the seller that the competing offer does not meet the requirements for a competing offer. Okay, this is super cool. So um, <laughs> now um, if somebody uses a 35E um, and I, as a buyer's agent, notice mm, that's not an equivalent offer for one of the reasons we stated earlier. Um, I, I have to give notice to the seller that um, you're incorrect and my offer is not 440 because you did this incorrectly. So if the buyer fails to timely provide notice that the competing offer is deemed to not to meet the requirements, um, then um, then it's waived, right? So if I, if I don't catch that the 35E was filled in incorrectly after three days, then tough luck. At that point, we are now mutually accepted at 440. If the buyer provides timely notice to the seller within three days to terminate, um, whoa, let me reread this. If the buyer provides timely notice to the seller, the seller has two days, if not filled in, to terminate the agreement and the earnest money shall be refunded to the buyer. Or if the seller does not timely terminate the agreement, the buyer is entitled to purchase property at the non-escalated price. Okay, so what that is saying is if you, um, you give notice to the seller, hey, you filled out 35 e wrong. Um, and so we're actually pending at you know, 420 instead of 440 and here's why. Um, and the seller can then back out after two days, in which case the buyer gets their earnest money back, sorry, I think I'm mixing up what I said. The seller can then just back out after two days or they can renegotiate within two days. But if the seller does not do either of those, right? Like they don't say, okay, we're good with 320 or we're, or we're terminating because we're not okay with 320 and we're gonna go back to market, then it's automatically accepted at the corrected amount that the buyer's agent corrected them at. Sorry, I'm not trying to be confusing. This is just, this is all confusing and, and lots of legal jargon. So bear with me here and please stop me if you guys think I'm explaining something poorly or you want to clarify. And then there is a new form, the 35E in, um, which is how you give notice um, if, the, if the form was filled out incorrectly. Okay. There have been many disputes over the calculation of the escalation purchase price. The new purchase price section of the form 35E provides a method for addressing such disputes. First, paragraph four may be used by the listing broker and the seller to calculate the escalated purchase price. The section is no longer a worksheet and is the recitation of the new purchase price. In the new paragraph four, the buyer has three days for mutual acceptance to provide notice to the seller the new purchase price is incorrect, which I already said. Um, so it looks like there's no worksheet anymore. And I'm going to pull that up on my screen so we can see what that looks like. Yeah, they haven't released. They said that they were going to be released by the third. So tomorrow the new forms will be released. So we don't actually have what that looks like, but I guess it's, I guess they're not going to, um, the way I understand what I just read, they're not going to have the worksheet anymore. I guess I will share my screen and show you this. I'm kind of learning as I go here. So I could be misreading this, but my understanding of what that was just saying is they're going to take out this whole portion here and you're just going to say new purchase price is this and here's the competing offer. And um, I don't know why they would have done that, but that is what they did. So that's exciting. Um, so now it is 
the final disclosure that says here is again, there, there are risks associated with using a form 35E. If you choose to use a form, you should be aware of the potential challenges associated with the form and discuss those issues with your client. The party should use new escalation addendum notice form 35 EN to provide the above notices. Um, Craig, you can speak up if you have an opinion on this. Something that somebody did to me, um, uh, a listing agent did for me earlier last year, and I thought it was really interesting, and I'm not telling you sh you should do this. I'm still kind of working through it, but I thought it was a clever idea. She said, um, I don't like the form 35 E. It's complicated, um, and this is her words, um, and, I, I, and it leads to too many potential disputes. So um, we are crossing it out. On the addendum line, we're taking it out of the contract and we're countering you at 440 using my previous example. And we're sending you the competing offer so that you can see why we did that. Like we can see that you can see that we really did escalate your offer up to 440 and we had the right to do it, but we're taking out the 35E. I didn't plan on saying that going into this meeting, but I thought that was a really interesting idea, right? Because then you kind of take out all these different steps, like where they send you the 35E and you have three days to, to, to review it and make sure it's correct. Anyways, that's one solution to that potential. <clears throat> the backup addendum form 38A has been revised to require the seller to give notice to the buyer within two days as opposed to three days of learning that the first sale fail, failed to close. Um, not a big change. Um, and then they said there's, and then there's been a lot of other minor, minor uh, wording changes on a bunch of forms. I'm not even gonna read them all. Um, a lot of them just changed from selling agent to buyer's agent. Um, the form 11, the referral agreement clarifies that the designated broker now has to sign. It used to just say uh, the referring firm and didn't say who had to sign. Um, so now if you ever are referring a client to another firm, um, I have to sign it. Um, some changes to the form 40, and so on. Anyways, um, my, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have Rachel send you guys the handout that I use for all my notes here. Um, and um, please contact me if you have any questions about this. Also, the MLS is doing classes on these all week. I think I covered everything. Like I said, I reviewed most of this with, um, with an attorney at the uh, Northwest MLS, so I feel pretty comfortable um, that everything I said is, <laughs> is correct albeit confusing. Um, but yeah, feel free to join those classes and any, any questions? I have a question. Absolutely. I've been trying to follow all your forms. This is uh, a lot more complicated than our uh, contracts in Las Vegas. So um, our purchase and sale agreement was 11 pages that included most all of these documents. So I'm just having a little problem um, trying to figure out which documents are required when you go into contracts, say, you know, for your buyer, what do you have to upload? What do you have to have them signed? Um, when I was, like I said, with the Realty One office in Vegas, um, we had a, and I think Robin's, Robin or Rachel sent it to me. Um, I had a form that, um, that Realty One put out and it's, it starts right at the top. How come I can't see, let me see. Try okay. to get my I'll, I'll just, um, I'll have Sarah um, or Rachel send that in the recap email. It's um, something that Sarah created and it's um, mandatory documents followed by if applicable documents um, as, as reminders for when you're writing an offer. In general, you need a form 21 or a purchase and sale form depending on what the, what the type of property is. If there's financing, you need a 22A. The 22D is a, is a, um, a, uh, Optional clause addendum that has a bunch of different options, uh, like seller must clean the property, uh, identification of utilities, and so on. You've got the 22K, which is where they disclose the utility companies. 22K, mm -hmm. if applicable, if it's 1978 or older. Um, 22T is the title contingency. And then you've got the form 35, which is the inspection contingency. Um, there's a lot of other forms, obviously. The blank 30, form 34 can be used if there's not a form for something, which there normally is a form for something. Um, there's, you know, all kinds of addendums out there, but those are the big ones. Those ones I just mentioned, you know, the, I didn't mention, obviously, if there is a well, you've got a well addendum, you've got a septic addendum, if applicable and so on. But Sarah's, um, Sarah has a handout that will include. Yeah, she actually, she actually sent it to me, but it's also um, like, once you go into contract, you know, there's also additional forms required um, 
it's it's just a little bit harder to comprehend how to, um, I mean, our form basically had a four rows. Okay, you're gonna need this with a new transaction. You're gonna need this with a tr new home transaction. transaction. You're gonna need this with a traditional sale, short sale, REO, so on yep. and so on. And now you guys have a lot of these escalating addendums, which I'm sure are pretty popular now, which I understand you need, but um, it's just a little hard to follow the steps of which is needed to, at what time without having to talk to someone constantly and not have a, you know. No, you're right. It is hard, and I'm not, and I'm not trying to say it's simple. It's it's definitely hard. So yeah, I would just say um, for for you and anybody else, if you have questions about what forms to use for certain transactions, um, I'm I'm available 24/7, and okay. there's no dumb question, right? Especially. Okay. Especially um, <laughs> whether you're a new agent or in your case, you're just coming from a totally different MLS and totally different forms. Um, yeah, just call me and, and you'll pick it up really quick. But yeah, just call me and we'll um, and I'll and I'll walk you through what forms are required and what forms you may want to consider for different circumstances. Okay, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Any other questions?